The first week that I worked in the mill, I worked 55 hours, and I drew $6.66. And uh, I thought that was the most money I had ever seen in my life. I took that $6.65, and I had a ball with what my daddy didn't get. I gave him part of it. But uh, uh, we went to work, I believe it was at 6 in the morning, and we got off at 15 to 6. We were off an hour for lunch. We could, they would let us, 45 minutes for lunch, they would let us go home for lunch. And we'd come back, and we had all kind of fun. We could, uh, it was kind of leisurely like when I first went to work. They, you had to, they wanted you to stay on your job, of course, but we did, being kids like, we played around more than we should have. And uh, so gradually, I got up to, after I'd worked a few weeks, I got up to 11.55. I, now, when I made $11.55, honey, that was some money. I could just buy anything I wanted to then, I thought. And uh, so I, I, I guess it was for maybe two or three years that that's what I drew, $11.55. But after a while, things changed, and uh, they expected a little more out of you. And uh, then, too, the personnel was different. And they started uh, other kind of winders that some of us had to get on the other kind of winders and run them. They had foster winders and then another kind of winder that I wasn't accustomed to very much, but I didn't run them some. And I can't remember the name of those. But anyway, uh, we'd work on those for a while, and uh, <clears throat> we would, they had us work by check. And what I mean by working by check, they would fill the boxes full of yarn. They had boxes, oh, I guess about that large, about that wide, and about that deep. And every time they fill one of those, we would uh, get, uh, uh, they'd give us a check. And we get so much a check, they'd pay us by check then. And we finally got up to 15, 16, 17, 20 dollars and things like that. And then when President Roosevelt came into office, you know, when he done all the good deeds that he did, well, things got better. Not only did they get better with the money part, with the wages, but also the uh, work that we had different, we was running rayon and nylon and all things like that. And our wages were increased again. But I worked for 23 years and I never made $60 a week in my life in that mill. But it was fun. If I had it to go over again, I would still say that it was a, it was a good life in a way because life's what you make it. And we, we enjoyed it. There was hard times and bad times, but you know, what you don't have, you never miss. And everybody there had the same thing. We were all just alike. There was no rich, no poor. We were all the same thing. We were all poor, and we didn't know it. We just had a lot of fun with it. What was the difference between uh, your house in the country and your house in the mill village? We had a, at one time, we owned a real nice home just outside of Carrollton. We had a, I guess it was about a six-room house. And if you've ever been on Alabama Street, I think there's a Bonnell place there now. And our land went from that street back to the river. My daddy had a lot of land, a lot of uh, animals and all like that. And we had a real nice home. But then later on, we got to, he got to where we would, he, he sold that place, he bought another place. And I don't know how many times he went through that. He bought several and he'd go from one to the other. And finally he wound up where he would just, uh, uh, he didn't buy another house. He and an uncle of mine that owned a lot of land, they would work, I think they called it working on halves. And so our houses were always fairly decent in the country, and uh, they were livable, and we didn't know but what they were mansions because living out in the country, you didn't see it. Everything you seen was just about just alike, you know. But when we moved to the mill village, we had electric lights and running water, and I thought that was heaven on earth. That was the happiest I ever was when I didn't have to go d draw a bucket of water out of the well. And we could just turn on that faucet and I just thought we were rich. I just knew we were rich. It took me a long time to think of that we wasn't as half as well off as I thought we were. But it was fun. And we had the little lights that just hung down from the ceiling. And we had those until after President Roosevelt came in. And then they changed things again, you know, and we had more modernization and they put, uh, 
Uh, they painted the houses real nice, and my husband and me would always keep ours the inside of them. We lived on a mill village. We always kept ours just like it belonged to us. We would always keep the walls painted and uh, keep the yards up because I don't like to live where the yards is not nice and the house is not clean. And so uh, I couldn't tell too much difference. I don't guess, I guess if I had to say, but I remember one time when we lived in the country and we didn't have any screen doors and we'd be picking cotton and we'd come home for dinner every day and my mother would always have, you know, when you're raised in the country, you have the best food in the world. She'd have all kind of vegetables and meats, and I, I never will forget. It was, uh, oh, there was the most flies that year, and we didn't have any screen. But you know what I do when I ate my lunch? I crawled up under a bed where it was good and dark, where the flies couldn't get to me, and I had the best time under there sleeping for one hour till I had to go back to the field. Now, uh, with all of this, could you talk about the 1934 strike? Do you have any idea why it took place? Well, I, I can remember that uh, it was kind of secretive at first. You know, they was uh, getting a un wanted to get a, have a union. And so, as I told you before, it caused some confusion because some people were for the, for the union and some people was not, were not for the union. And it caused a little bit of confusion. But uh, in the, you know, the uh, overseers in the mill, I don't think, as, as well as I remember, they weren't allowed to vote. But you could tell, they'd talk, go around to talking to people, and we were always afraid to, t you hated to tell somebody you was for the union, and you hated to tell somebody was you was against it, because you'd make an enemy either way. And my father was all, he, he wasn't for it at all, and naturally we weren't, but our neighbors were, and I remember that it played on that way. I don't remember how, exactly how long, but uh, I can, I can remember seeing, reading in the paper and hearing what was going on at the other mills. By the way, Newton Cotton Mills owned the mill we lived at and one here in town. And so we heard one day that the, finally they all got together. I don't know where the meet, that final meeting took place, but I know they were marching and they were in cars, you know, and all kind of contraptions as well as I can remember. And so they came through down at East Newton and uh, I remember that uh, there were so many of them, and the people that, on, that lived at East Union on the village there, they would gather up down close to the road just to watch them. And they was uh, always just hollering and, and ugly. It was ugly. I'm not going to say that it wasn't ugly. It's grown people are hollering and acting that way. But uh, nothing happened that in, there wasn't anybody heard anything like that. And uh, so that, uh, then the, they closed the mill down. As well as I remember, they just closed the mill. And the ones that they call, some of the ones they call the strikers, well, they got a place, there's an old pond down by the mill, and they all had them a stick. And they got in there and sit there that night. I can just remember that. And I was frightened. I think all the young people were because we really didn't know what was going on too much. I was old enough to know, but I guess I just didn't have sense enough. I didn't understand it all. And so uh, uh, I don't remember how many nights they stayed there, and I don't remember. I remember don't remember how, where they marched, but I think they left there and went on to Lagrange. It was Lagrange or Columbus somewhere. They were going that way, and uh, so I remember when they decided that they would open the mill up. I don't know how long that was. I think it was a few weeks, and uh, we all met down at a bridge right below the mill. They got us all word that everybody, of course, I wasn't working then because I was expecting a baby and, and I wasn't working, but I was seeing what was going on like the rest of them were. So they all met down there below the mill. I guess everybody that had a job, just crowds of people. And I remember the, the overseer, superintendent, and all of them was there. And they talked to them and they talked nice. They didn't fuss. They didn't say anything bad, but they just told them all that wanted to work. They could work, have a job if they'd go back to work then. But all that didn't go to work, they didn't have a job. And so I can remember one man in particular, and I won't call the name, but he was standing there. He was one of the big ones that was on strike too, but didn't nobody know much, know that he was, you know. He hadn't let it be known. But he had a stick in his hand. He was holding it there. And when uh, they said that uh, everybody that wants to go back to work can go back to work, and I can just see that stick now just as it slid down out of his hand and hit the ground. So a lot of the people went back to work and a lot of the people didn't go back to work. Some of them left and went other places, had to find other kind of work. 
But after we got back to work, it was all settled down. There wasn't any more confusion. As far as I can remember, I don't think there was any confusion. The hurt feelings was over. It was just a thing that happened just right then, and nobody held a grudge after that. Was there any other attempt to have a union here that you recall? Not at that, I don't recall at that meal. I know there have been in other places I've heard of it, but I don't remember ever attempting that again. Not while eating, not while Union Cotton Mill had it, and I don't know about this last meal that they've had, you know. But uh, as far as I can remember, everything was, you know, back to normal. And uh, it was a good place to work. It was a good place to work. It, we didn't make, as I told you, we didn't make all that much money, but, uh, you know, we made enough to live on, and so we were happy. Do you remember the National Guard being here? I, I, I don't remember seeing them. I remember hearing it, you know, but I didn't see them. So I, I couldn't tell much about that. I do remember that there was other people and from other mills came through, you know. And I can remember that there was some trouble. I don't know where, where it happened, but, you know, as we were talking the other day, somebody had to go to jail and stay for two or three nights or something of the sort. I don't remember exactly how. But I just don't know too much about that because, as I say, I wasn't working and I just seen what was going on right there, you know. And back then there wasn't many cars, there wasn't many moods of traveling. You didn't have many ways to go. And so we mostly just lived at East Newton and Newton. And then we got ready to come to town, my mother and me would walk up the railroad and we'd come to town walking. And we would, then you didn't go casual. You wore the best you had wherever you went. We would start to town. We would put on our old shoes, but we would put our best shoes in a paper bag, and when we got to the city limits, we put on our good shoes, and we'd wear the best clothes that we had. And it wasn't casual like it is now. Now you go like you're comfortable, but then you wore the best you had, even just to go to town buy groceries. And the best you had wasn't much. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't remember if it did. Now, then they were having, a, they just had one church down there, and we had a Methodist preacher and a Baptist. We had Baptist services one Sunday and Methodist the next. And I really never did. I couldn't tell the difference because, you know, they, the services seemed just alike to me, and I supported one just as much as I supported the other. And, of course, I joined the Baptist church. I guess it was because, you know, back in my family, most all of them were Baptist, and I joined the Baptist church. But uh, I didn't know any different until the, the company finally, they finally got that settled. See, the company had owned the church. They had the church, it, when I first moved there, it was in the schoolhouse. There was a huge schoolhouse, beautiful building. I wish I had a picture of it I could show you. It was an old time, beautiful building with the big pillows and the things like that. And it was a schoolhouse, but they had church upstairs. And then the mill company built a church for them and things uh, changed. and. I mean, got, you know, much better. There wasn't any quarreling thing going on, but they, the church was all usually full on Sunday. And we had prayer meeting on Wednesday night and church on Sunday and Sunday night. So then uh, back in the 1960s, they built a Methodist church, and it's back this side of the cotton mill. And now there are two churches down there, so they're Baptist and a Methodist. So church was owned by the mill then, wasn't uh -huh. it? And did they take, uh, did they take part in choosing the minister and all of that? I don't remember if they did, but usually we had the superintendent, whoever was superintendent would be our Sunday school teacher. And uh, now Mr. D.M. Wood, you may have heard of him if you believe, he was, uh, he, was su he was superintendent when I went there, and he was Sunday school teacher for a long time. And then the next one was a Mr. Tuttle, I believe. And then the next one was a Mr. Nixon. And so they were, they were good teachers, and they were nice to the people that lived there. We had no complaints. We all enjoyed the church. And as I say, we, none of us knew the difference between the Methodist and the Baptist because it, it wasn't a formal thing like they have now, you know, like the Methodists. You know, there are a difference in the Methodist and Baptist, but it was all carried just alike. Someday and, I'll, I'll have to get you to tell me what the difference is. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> well, I can tell you a little bit of difference. I joined the Methodist Church about a month ago. 
after I got 79 years old. <laughs> I thought all my life I was a Baptist. I know the difference between a Methodist baptism and a Baptist baptism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it the Baptist hold the Methodist under a little bit longer? And and you know Methodists will sprinkle. They they sprinkle too. They'll immerse you if you want to, but if yeah. not, they it's sprinkle. Uh huh. It's like uh, yeah. you're doing a lot of ironing. Mm hmm. That sprinkling your clothes. Yeah, but you remember, you, yes. Remember the little uh, soda bottles? Oh yes, I've sprinkled a lot of them. I want you to tell because we may not have had the camera in the right position. I wonder if you could tell that story about the bridge again. Because he was tight on you, and we want to see your hands as you tell it. <laughs> Would you mind? No. Okay, well, just start and tell about the bridge. Oh. After it just started, after the strike was over. After the, after the strike was over, when they all met down at the bridge. Well, after the strike was over, and uh, they all came back, and they had got word out to all the people that lived on the village that they were going to be there that day, and they would... Uh, uh, be there to speak to them, and they wanted everybody to come to the bridge. And so uh, there was lots of people just crowded around, you know, most, well, I guess everybody that worked there, and the children, too, were there to see what was going on, of course. And so uh, we all just listened to them, and they talked and said, uh, one of the men got, up, men got up, and he the superintendent of the mill got up, and he said, now, everybody that wants a job has the job if they come back to work. If you don't come back to work, you don't have a job. And so a lot of them wouldn't go back. A lot of them decided they just wouldn't take the job. But as I told you about the man that was holding the stick, you know, he would been one that he was kind of an influential person. And uh, nobody knew till then that he was for the Union. But he had that stick in his hand. I mean, a lot of them knew that he had been over there with the men, you know, when they was guarding, keep you from going to the mill. But anyway, he had the stick in his hand and so, it just slid, just like he had a snake up there, and it just slid out and hit the ground. And so quite a few of them went back to work, and some of them never did go back to work. How, do you, how did that affect the community? I don't think it affected it all. Really, I think it probably helped it, because they had been, for a while, there was people were afraid to relate to, they didn't know how to relate to each other because they didn't want to hurt each other's feelings. Now we had a neighbor. I remember that my daddy was strictly against the union, but he would not. He wouldn't say anything about it. He wouldn't. He wouldn't discuss it. But this neighbor got peeved at my daddy and wouldn't have much to say to him about it. He could tell he didn't like it. But I think that after the strike was over, I think people got really closer. And so uh, I don't know. I don't know why they didn't. You know, most everywhere in other places, northern places, they did have unions, didn't they? But it was hard until the northern people started coming in here and putting up business. It was hard to get anything settled in the south, in Union, Georgia, around Georgia. Why do you think that's true? I know it's true. Yeah. Do you know why? Well, I don't know unless it was the wages. Mm -hmm. That's all I could ever figure out. I know they got always got better wages in the north and the south than they did in the south. And I never, I never could understand why, unless it was because they were organized. Could you talk about the, uh, the supervisors and the bosses and the, the owners? How did you know those people? Did they come around the mill? Uh, did you see them? Yes, the owners would uh, in and out, all just every little bit. Sometimes they'd come every day, and sometimes it would be a few days before you would see them. But they were nice to us. They they always would talk to us. stop. Maybe they'd see what we the kind of yarn we were running, and ask us maybe a question about it. And they would always have on their nice suits and would be dressed real nice, you know. But the uh, other bosses in the mill they were kind of casual, just like the working people, and they were good to us too. We did have one that people didn't like much. He was kind of fussy, but most all of them were real nice to us. They expected you to work, but I never will forget we had one superintendent one time and. We would want to, when we was going to get off for 45 minutes for lunch, he, they would want to stay at our work till the whistle blew. They would blow a whistle at, at uh, you know, for us to leave. And so we'd be so ready to go home till we just couldn't wait for that whistle to blow. And I could remember I, I got farther and farther and farther away from my winder. And the superintendent was standing pretty close by me, and he said, Oh, well, you're going to soon be out the door, won't you? And so... They were real nice to us, and sometimes we'd get peeved with them, and sometimes they got peeved with us. 
And I, I know that I was, I, I would want to go somewhere and talk, and I'd go over, and my boss band would come over and say, go back to your winder. And I'd go back, and you know, I didn't have sense enough to stay there. After I got all the ends up again, I'd take off somewhere else, and he'd have to come tell me again. I know he got tired of telling me, but I wasn't the only one. You know, we were just still kids, you might say. So it was, it was interesting. It was fun. If people could go back and see all that went on, and if I could just tell it just like it was, you'd have a ball. Could you tell us about the, uh, uh, the amusements around? Well, the most amusements, we had the little medicine shows that come through. I, that was fun. Oh, that was fun. And the first time I ever seen a fight between two women was a medicine show. Oh, we were all enjoying the show so well, and they were having, they'd had a little confusion between the children. I seen a commotion, and the people were gathered around. I didn't know what was going on. I got up pretty close by, and they were down on the ground just rolling and tumbling like two dogs pulling each other's hair and having a ball, and they fought it out for a good while. And the medicine show was about the only thing we had except we'd have parties. You know, that would be the young folks. We'd have candy pulling or singing or just just parties where we'd get to walk with our boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, and take walks with them, and that was that was fun part of it. And that was about the only amuse only amusement we had except they did have the movie in town, and my daddy didn't ever believe in the movies, so he wouldn't hardly ever let us go to the movies. We didn't get to go very often. And once in a while, we would slip off and go to a dance, and, but we had to slip off and go, you know. We could uh, make like we was somewhere else, but we'd wind up at the dance sometimes. So it was fun. We, that was about, that's about all we expected. I guess we were just as happy as we could be. We didn't know any better. We didn't know there was nothing else in the world. What about your education? My education? <laughs> I got my education in Carroll County at Oak Mountain School, and I didn't get much. I didn't get to get much education. But after I got out of school, my husband used to tell me he'd say, "Well, you know, you've got more education in books than you ever got when you was going to school." Because I had to quit. I had to go to work in the mill. As I say, my daddy lost everything he had, and I was the oldest child, and I had to go to work, and uh, so I had to. Didn't have a very good education, but I did study, and I, I would get books, and I've always liked to read. I, I still read all the time. And uh, then when we got the little grocery store, I, m my mother used to sit up with me to teach me math, arithmetic, and she'd sit up to midnight with me t trying to teach me. And uh, I did finally get along pretty good, but uh, after we got in the grocery store, I got better education there than I'd ever gotten in the schools. I said, if you want to get a good education, get in a grocery store. You don't only get educated in, in uh, with learning, you get educated in people. Everybody ought to run a business for six months. That's the best thing you can do to find out what's in the world. Now, you mentioned uh, that you, when you left the mill that you had lint all over you. And we've heard some people say that they felt ashamed to be what they call a lint Could you talk about that? No, I wasn't ever ashamed. You know, it didn't bother me a bit in the world because I've always been happy-go-lucky. And I would leave, and I'd have it on my house shoes. If I wore a pair, sometimes we'd wear a pair of felt house shoes. And my house shoes might be covered with it. And when that whistle blew, I'd take off home in the house shoes. And with lint, my hair would be, I, my hair was blonde then. I was real blonde. And just as full of cotton. And actually, I didn't care if it was white as snow. And some of them keep it combed out pretty well, but I never did worry about mine until I got home at night. It just didn't bother me at all because I'd been raised in the country. I was used to dirt. <laughs> and uh, you never felt the, 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 a matter of difference between you people in East Newman and the people in Newman? I, will, I, I can't say we didn't. We did. But uh, the major most of the people in Newman were from the old mill, too, you know. They were the Newnan didn't consist of, now you know Newnan was always known as the richest little town. And there were quite a few rich people here then. And you did feel kind of inferior when you were around those. But uh, the most people that we would see would be the uh, people that were just like us because the old bill, you know, was right here in the city limits. And they had the high school here. And the ones that lived up here could go to all through school and go to the high school. Of course, those at East Newnan, quite a few of them finished in, they, they came to Newnan after all for, you know, after so many years. 
but we did feel a little inferior in some ways. Okay, Judy. You know, the first time you told me about the bridge story, the man holding the uh -huh. stick, um, I wondered if, if you tell me about the stick, the man holding the stick, do you think, tell me again about the, the man slapping the stick, and well, tell me if you think he, um, it was a hard choice for him to make. I know it was. Well, see, he was one, he was one of the uh, overseers. This man was an overseer. And, of course, a lot of people didn't know until, you know, the, until the strat come on that he was, that, but he belonged to the union because they wasn't supposed to. And they met, you know, when they had the strike, I may have left this out, but they met over across the pond over there, a crowd of them, and they was guarding the mill. They had the mill shut down, you know, and so they all had the sticks. And I guess they meant if you try to get in the mill, we'll knock you in the head. I never did know what that was for unless it was a weapon. But anyway, when he, that day, he still had his stick in his hand when they had him to come back to the bridge, you know. And the day they told him that they could go back to work, and he, he st had his stick with him. And then everybody knew then that he, you know, did belong to the union. And so he wanted to go back to work. And when they said that we could all, they could all go back to work if they wanted to, he just let his stick slide like that and hit the ground. He was kind of embarrassed. I think he felt just if, if he felt like he looked, he was feeling bad because in front of all that crowd, you know. Oh, that it was sad looking. It was. It was. There was a lot of sad looking people because they knew they had to go back to work, whether they wanted to or not. But they seen that there was no use in trying to get a union started. That ended it. And I think the first, when they ever had organized, the first time I remember, I think it was organized, they called it the plastic plant came in. And I believe that was the first plant that I remember being organized. But Union Cotton Mill never was. Now you worked with, uh, all, all your customers in the grocery store were Cotton Mills, weren't they? Oh, we had some, some people from here in town. We knew people here in town, and then there were quite a few that would come out there, you know, and trade with us, and so we had quite a good group of customers, but the majority of them were from the Mill Village. When, uh, when you first moved into the Mill Village, did they have company stores? No, they never did have a company store. When we moved there, my uncle was running the only store that was there, and he ran that store for a few years, and then he sold out and went to Iron Co., and somebody else bought the store. And so it just, different ones had the stores, but the company, but i tell you one good kind of thing the company would let us do. They would, they would have somebody to go to the store between times, but if somebody wanted something to eat, they would maybe say at around 10 o'clock in the morning, 9.30 or 10, they'd, somebody would go around, they'd ask some boss man if they could go to the store, and he'd tell them yes, and they would go to around and ask anybody what they wanted from the store. We would all tell him what we, you know, what we wanted, and he would, We'd send the money or have it charged, but sometimes we'd have it charged. All of us that had charge accounts. And so it was, uh, we had a lot of fun. Okay. We'd have candy, he'd bring us candy, you know. And, and finally they put the Coca-Cola machines and the snack wagons in the dope mill. Dope wagon? Mm-hmm, dope wagon, that's right. That's what they called it, the dope wagon. And we'd crowd around the dope wagon. The boy, we were sitting living in high cotton then. father loved the country so much, I imagine leaving the country and coming here was difficult for him. Oh, yes. Could you tell me about that transition? Judy, would you yeah. like to talk a little bit first before okay. 